We are in an incredible season at Mosaic Church. God is, God's doing some amazing things here. I, I'm, do you feel it? Do you feel it too? Just God's doing some amazing things. I mean, I get testimonies every week of people that are seeing healings, financial breakthroughs, God's touching bodies. He's saving people out of darkness into his marvelous light. I mean, all the good stuff is happening. But this week we've had, we had one of the most amazing times in the Lord last Sunday. I mean, it was incredible here. And we walked away, and on Monday morning, my phone started to beep while I was in Greece, letting me know of multiple people who had become ill. And I thought, Holy Spirit, I know you. And I know the attack of the enemy that comes when you're on the verge of breakthrough. I know it. Now, don't hear me wrong. I don't believe that this particular thing is just some outbreak that devil, the devil came and set himself up and came and attacked each individual household. But what I am saying is, is that the enemy will use opportunity to stop the momentum of a people to distract them. And here's what we're going to do. The Bible's really clear. When you sense that and you become wise to it, you pray it through. You pray it through. You don't just acknowledge it, but you pray it through. So what I want to do before I introduce our speaker today, I want you and I to take a minute and let's pray some things through. Can we pray for some people in our congregation? Because we probably have at least 30 or 40 who right now are facing sickness and we just need to believe God for them. Is that okay? Lord, we thank you today. You are our healer. We just declare, come on, let's make some declaration. Lord, we just declare over households today that, Lord, you are bringing your healing power to homes. Lord, you're breaking the back of sickness and disease and ailment. Lord, we're coming against infirmity today, and we're declaring the healing balm of Gilead that will flow from the top of the headship to the bottom of the feet. And we declare that the oil of gladness will return to homes, and that today, Lord, you are strengthening moment by moment people. Lord, we come against every infirmity that would set itself up to be called by a name in our society to produce fear. And we say today that we are healed of the Lord. That today that by your stripes we have been healed. We take our authority as sons and daughters of the living King and we declare healing over the household of faith. We declare healing over Mosaic Church. We declare healing over men and women's lives. We thank you for proper breathing we thank you for the sickness and disease to fall away. We thank you today, Lord, that fevers must go and energy must be returned and restoration of health in every way. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Amen. Woohoo! Now, when we get done with service, keep going. Yeah, you're doing good, Jane. You keep going. You and me, we work together. When we get done with service, you make sure you text someone that you know has not been feeling well and you say, we prayed for you. This is what we prayed. This is what I declared. This is what I'm believing over you. Okay, will you promise to do that after service? Send it to somebody. Let them know. It's my special privilege to yield this pulpit today to an incredible, uh, I don't want to refer to her incorrectly, an incredible younger, not young, younger pastor on our team. It's, yes, all of, oh, thank you. Oh, I'm, I've been reminded. All of you that are in our Ignite, this is your moment. I'm always forgetting this. Thank you, Joe. All of our Ignites, this is your moment, guys. Go ahead. When I came to Mosaic Church, I came with a few things that I knew were just parts of who I was. Um, it didn't mean that they were not, they were not evident here. It just meant they were part of who I am as well. And I needed them to become part of whatever it was I was going to pastor. They had to be evident. They had to be clear. And one of those was I'm completely and utterly dedicated to developing and discipling my team. I'm just dedicated to it. Now, I'm dedicated to discipling you too, but I'm also dedicated to creating platforms and opportunities for those that I know have a call of God on their life. When I met Georgia, Pastor Georgia Spicer, I knew there was a seed in her. Just the way she spoke, her insight, her ability to discern, her ability to see past the things that were around her. I had never met a human, probably outside of myself, that could have a whole conversation about spiritual things on the phone with me while she had three little babies under six running around in the background. 
completely capable of multitasking. But really more than that, she has a voice within a voice. Now, not everybody carries that. Some people, they have a voice because someone else created a platform. But then there are people that they're speaking the voice of heaven. And that when they talk, they're speaking with the voice within the voice. And Georgia is one of those. She carries a word within her. She carries a word that I believe is for her generation. And I believe it's my utter privilege to make room for her and to give her the opportunity to express the gift of God that is so evident on her life that I've been able to see and now I get to share with you. So would you do me the great privilege as Mosaic Church and welcome Pastor Georgia Spicer as she comes to bring the word. Wow. I mean, that's one way to be introduced. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Pastor Amanda. And I just want to say before I start, it is honestly such a privilege and an honor to be given the opportunity to stand up here today and share with you guys what I think God has put on my heart. Now, about a couple of weeks ago, I'm just going to type my password in. I, am, I can multitask, but obviously not right now. <laughs> um, yeah, so... A couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity to go to a conference that I felt like I was a bit of an intruder in because it was full of these people that were doing the most incredible things for the kingdom of God from across all over the world. And this specific pastor was from Mexico, and he runs quite a large church in Mexico in, he said, the third most dangerous city in the world, I think he said. But this is what he said, that um, the first time he spoke, someone said to him, you are not up there to impress. You are only up there to express what God has given you to say. So anytime I've felt nervous over the last couple of weeks, I've told myself, I am only up here to express what God has already put on my heart to give to you all. I'm not here to impress. <laughs> so shall we pray? Lord, I just want to thank you so much that you are a big God, that you are the God. You are bigger than everything, Lord. I want to thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here today, that we get to gather here today, Lord, to listen, to worship you and to listen to the word, Lord. And I just pray that the words that come out of my mouth, Lord, that I am just your mouthpiece this morning, Lord. And I pray that it meets anyone in this room where they're at, Lord. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. So a little bit about myself. I'm sure some of you already know who I am, but my name is Georgia Spicer. I'm married to Josh Spicer, and we have three beautiful daughters, Isabel, who is five, Everly, who is three, and Rosa, who is two. So I do have my hands full, and they are my Monday, well, they're my 24-7, aren't they? But that is what I do. I am a mum, and um, I gave up my job as an interior designer um, I only did it shortly, but I was an interior designer for show homes. I gave that up to be fully dedicated to my beautiful children. And in, prior to being an interior designer, I studied at Loughborough University. And I studied innovation in textiles, uh, innovation and design in textiles. And I, you could choose a pathway of where that took you. And I chose the pathway of weaving. So you can imagine the, the industrial, like old school style weaving. So if I could just, I can't really explain, but the looms were probably half the size of this rug. If you can see, they were huge. They were so much taller than me and bigger. And there was, they were quite overwhelming. But that's what I chose to do, to, to create fabric from the very beginning so that I could see the way it led me through. Now, you're probably wondering why I am telling you all about my degree and about why I chose weaving. Well, as I was thinking about what I'm going to share with you this morning, I found myself drawn to this idea of the process of putting a weave together. And I think it's going to really help me explain what I, I'm here to talk to you about this morning. And my title is Becoming Fruit Bearers. There must be evidence on us. In other words, there must be evidence on us when we live a Holy Spirit-filled life. The outward, visible, godly display of the inward, invisible presence of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. And that evidence comes in the form of the fruits of the Spirit, which are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and self-control. Shall we stand as I read, um, the, the, read two scriptures? 
So my first scripture is from Romans 12, and it's verse 2. Yeah, it's on the screen. So it's, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Now, if you've been to Bean and Leaf, which is just down the road, I actually think Scott said this exact same thing. But if you've been to Bean and Leaf, it's just down the road. It's a coffee shop in Coventry. They have this plastered on their wall, and it is, I think it's such an incredible scripture. So do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And then my second scripture is from Matthew 4, um, and it's verse 19 to 20. And he saith unto them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straight away left their nets and followed him. Thank you, you can sit down. I mean, I chose both of these scriptures for a reason, because they both talk of a transformation. See, when we allow the Holy Spirit, Pastor Amanda spoke, uh, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, about the dove that came and rested and when Jesus was baptized, spoke about an air, creating an environment where the dove can be invited in. So, uh, in other words, where the Holy Spirit can be invited into your life. So, Um, when we allow the Holy Spirit to work in us, there is a transforming that happens in our lives. And what I think is so good about things that happen on the inside of us is that they have to come out of us. They can't just stay in. You see, when I produce a piece of woven fabric, when I produced it for my degree, I had a strategic process that I had to follow, and I had to follow it by the book. I had to follow it properly, because if I did not follow this process, I would not produce an exquisite piece of fabric that I am promised to produce if I did follow this process. Now, I want to break down the process of how you go from the start of a weave to the piece of fabric at the end, because I think that it's going to really help me explain how we can become fruit bearers. Now, when you create a weave, it's a really complicated process. So I've tried my hardest to narrow it down to three points. Um, Because if you've ever done that, I don't know if anyone has ever used an industrial loom before, there is lots and lots of little bits of detail that go into it. But I've done my best, and I've got to three points. So point number one, choose your weaving pattern. See, um, when I want to design my weave, I kind of know what I want it to look like, I know my inspiration, but I have to choose a pattern in the first place. If you look at the clothes you're wearing today, you'll probably be able to see that there's a continuous pattern that's going on. It could be a plain weave, a twill weave, it could be a herringbone weave, they're the most obvious, there are lots more, but I'll stick to the three obvious. And you see, this pattern was pre-decided, they'd chosen this pattern already because that's what they had to do before they could actually create the piece of fabric. Throughout life, we are presented with constant choices. They're always coming at us in every direction. And if we haven't pre-decided the pattern that we want to follow, how on earth are we going to make those choices? We're not going to have anything to revert back to. We need something to revert back to when we are making those choices. Paul is telling us in Romans 12 two things. Number one, that pattern exists. And number two, that it's in our nature to follow pattern. So if we haven't pre-decided our pattern, already, well then we're going to end up following patterns that weren't our choice. There are so many patterns in the world, just to give some, fashion. Everyone follows fashion trends. I like to follow fashion trends. Food. There's food trends. Um, There is the choice that there is patterns of where you're going to go, what you're going to listen to, what's on TV at the moment. These are all patterns that we face, and there are so many more. And like I said, it's in our nature to follow these patterns. But if we have pre-decided our pattern, if we have pre-decided the pattern we're going to follow, then when these other patterns come in our way, we can revert back to the pattern that we have pre-decided, and we can make our decision based on that and not of the fleshly desires that are in front of us because when we don't make our decisions through flesh when we don't make our decisions through the Holy Spirit and we make them through flesh I'm telling you now you're going to feel energyless careless and fruitless because you are not reverting back to the pre-decided pattern as we need to make our choices through the Holy Spirit um, I I'm sure most of you know that quite a few years ago, nearly four years ago, um, my husband, Josh, fell quite ill. And um, a lot of people know that story, and we tend to share that story where he fell ill quite dramatically. 
um, and he went through an operation and he had to then go through further treatment and now he just has um, six monthly checkups. And that is the story we tell all the time because I did learn a lot through that. But what I don't tend to tell is what happened after because this was more personal and to an extent, I probably felt a little bit ashamed about the way that I felt because in the moment where Josh was getting six monthly checkups and still is and he gets a clean bill of health every single time, um, you should be celebrating, right? That is the natural instinct. And don't get me wrong, I did celebrate and I do celebrate every single time we get that call or he has his appointment and they're like, yeah, you're doing great. But I found myself in that time after all of the treatment had happened after life settled down and we were getting back into normal life. I found myself withdrawing, withdrawing from relationships, actually even withdrawing a little bit from my marriage as well because I was so scared of the bad things that could happen because something bad had already happened. So why wouldn't it happen again? I couldn't watch the news anymore. I couldn't watch serious movies. Everything was lighthearted. I had to watch the Disney princess films with my children all the time. I could not watch the movies that everyone else was going on about. Um, and I let fear rush into every part of my life, especially when it came to my children. Any illness they had, anything, I just was like, well, bad things happen, so it's going to be bad, isn't it? Like, Val, my eldest daughter, she had a tummy bug this one day and I, I told myself the million things of all the dangerous things that she could have and we need to get her to hospital and I'm stressing out, panicking because I had told myself that bad things had happened. I, was, did no, I no longer felt invincible, which you do. especially when you're young, you feel invincible. You see these stories, you see people, bad things happening and you just think, that's never going to happen to me and then it does. And um, I, I just, I was scared. I was definitely fearful. It says in Galatians 5, let the spirit direct your lives and you will not satisfy the desires of the human nature. You see, I was allowing myself to be conformed by the patterns of this world. I was allowing flesh to decide and to discern my choices. I was allowing flesh to make the decision when Isabel was ill and, and decide, oh, that's it, she's dying. I was allowing flesh to come in when I had a, a good friend and I found myself withdrawing from that relationship because I just thought, well, bad things happen. I was allowing flesh to control my choices. But you know what was amazing? 10 years prior to that, I, I think it was about 10 years, I was baptized. And like people are going to be baptized this evening, I was baptized and I made the decision publicly that I have chosen my pattern. I have pre-decided the pattern that I am going to follow. I have pre-decided that pattern. So when I needed it, 10 years later, I was able to pull myself out of a hole where fear was taking control. I was able to pull myself out of that because I had pre-decided the pattern that I was going to follow. Just like when I pre-decided the pattern of the piece of fabric I was going to make, the Holy Spirit sets out a pattern for us, and that is Jesus. We get to follow Jesus. And I pre-decided that pattern when I got baptized in front of people that I was going to follow Jesus. So no matter what decisions came my way, no matter what situations I found myself in, I know, I think Pastor Amanda spoke about pre-decisions a while back, I know that I have pre-decided that I am following the pattern of Jesus and that is what I can always revert back to. Thank you. Um, yeah, in Matthew 4, it says, I use Matthew 4 as my second scripture. It speaks about um, Simon, so Simon, who was later called Paul Simon, and Andrew, who um, Jesus came to them and said, drop your nets and follow me because I'm going to make you fishers of men. And they said, and they dropped their nets at once. And I think that is the bit of the story that amazes me because they dropped their nets at once, just like that. In all versions, it's like at once or straight away or immediately. And what struck me on that is, in my opinion, is that do you think they would have dropped their nets like straight away, like that quickly, if they hadn't already pre-decided their pattern? If they hadn't already decided that they were going to follow Jesus? Because then when the opportunity came in front of them, they, just, they, they were able to just do it like that, do it straight away, because they had already pre-decided their pattern. I was able to speak Jesus over my situation because the, because. The Holy Spirit, just like when I chose the woven pattern to follow, I've said this already, gives us Jesus our pattern to follow. Simon and Andrew chose Jesus as their pattern to follow. 
Point number two, choose your yarn. So basically, in other words, what tool am I using? When um, I have chosen my pattern, I'm talking in my uh, degree terms here, when I've chosen my pattern and um, I know the pattern I want to do for my piece of fabric, I then have to go into what we call the weaving shed, which is where all the looms are. And when I say thousands, I really mean thousands of yarn to choose from, like so many. And there's a, a technician in there who kind of helps you and guides you through, and you tell him what you want, and he goes and reels it off and then tells you the price of it all. But um, it's kind of overwhelming. So you can imagine it's, it's separated into like cotton, um, wool, monofilament, I don't know if you'd have heard of monofilament, um, and uh, bamboo, things like that. It's separated into all the types of yarn. But it doesn't just stop there. You then have to decide the characteristics of the yarn that you want, so the strength, the, the thickness, um, the durability of it, because it has to fit the pattern that you've picked. If the characteristics don't fit, then you're not going to be able to create the pattern that you want. So, in our terms, in kingdom terms, I was thinking, what are our characteristics? What are our values? What are the things that drive us? Because our values, our pillars in our life are the things that are going to allow us to follow that pattern. They're the things that are going to allow us to stick to the pattern and revert back to it because our values, they drive us. Our values show us our freedoms and they show us our boundaries. And um, when um, I was first asked to be part of the pastor's team, um, Pastor Amanda and Pastor Jason, they had us around the house and we were having a meeting and uh, we were asked a question as a team. What do you think your own personal values are? And you think, oh yeah, I can do that. But I think I reeled off about 200 things, that, but they were probably more like my passions and my dislikes and the things I'm into, not really the core pillars that make me me. Um, and I was advised that there's probably about three or four. And it is quite a big task. I think it's taken me the best part of a year to kind of come up with what I think my core values are. One of them being, I'm really being vulnerable here, I'm letting you know my actual values. And one of them being, it's a really, really big deal to me if I think someone is upset with me, if I think someone is not happy with me, if I am not in their good books, let's say. That's a really big deal. It really bothers me and it drives a lot of my decisions um, if if I think I've upset someone. And, um, and I think being, um, being given the task of discovering my values was a real game changer to me because it made me realize where I was allowing my values to strengthen me, but also where I was allowing them to hinder me, where I was allowing them to set me back. Because for me, if I know someone's upset, sometimes it can make me a bit insecure and I can probably step back a little bit and go inside myself a little bit and then things go on inside my head, begin to fester, then you find yourself getting angry and before you know it, you're probably not well um, because you've allowed it to fester up inside of you. But because I was now aware of this value, I was able to use it to my strength, but I could only use it to my strength if, as it says in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You see, when we're not feeling our best, it's because we're not connected to the vine. It's because we are not getting deeper and de getting a deeper and deeper relationship being connected to the vine and our values are not echoing God's values. You see, when we connect to the vine and we get deeper and deeper and we root ourselves deeper into this vine, then before you know it, our values are going to echo God's values. And so that value of where I am so and bothered by the way people, if they're upset with me, I didn't need to use that to hinder me anymore because I was connected to God's values and they were becoming more like him. I was able to use that value to my strength. I was able to go to that situation, whatever it might be, and say, I know this has not gone the right way. I'm, I'm sorry that I've upset you. How can we sort this out? 
And now that I'm connected to the vine, I know the pattern that I've got to revert, revert back to. I know the characteristics of myself and the values that make me me. I'm connected to the vine and my values are becoming his values and I'm getting deeper and deeper into that. I am then able to live out of the overflow of that and it is able to pour into my relationships and into the way that I respond to situations. So it's not just for me, it's for others around me as well. So, um, point number three, threading your loom, putting the work in to prepare. Um, I mean, I spoke about that just then, about putting the work in once I know my values and I'm connected deeper to the vine, I'm connected deeper to God, and I am working on my relationship, creating an organic relationship with God, then I can do the work. But you see, threading your loom, this is a process that is probably not the most fun thing. So if you can imagine the size of the loom that I showed you, so it's quite big, and then I, for some reason, I don't know what took over me, I decided to make a complete piece of fabric. And it's not just a short piece, it probably had to run from where the drums are to the back of the church. So it's not, it's not small. <laughs> um, and um, I chose silk. So I had 2,700 pieces of yarn to thread. Which is a lot, yeah, it really is a lot, because you don't just thread them in bulk. You have one piece of yarn that has to go through one reed, and a reed is a thin piece of wire with a small hole in the middle, and each piece of yarn has to go through that reed. And not only does it stop there, the reeds are on rows. So you have to make sure each yarn is in the right reed on the right um, row, there's lots of R's there, on the right row, otherwise your pattern gets disformed. And if you don't do it correctly, so embarrassing, kind of stupid story, I was on um, yarn number 723, right? I made a mistake on yarn number five. <laughs> so I had to go all the way back to yarn number five and start again. And it really is a long process. It takes about a week, maybe more, to do this. And I have to do this right, otherwise I can't then produce the piece of fabric that I would, would hand in for my degree. So it really is a long, cold, tedious process. And you see, in kingdom terms, this is the work of us developing fruit. This is the everyday life of consistency. It doesn't just stop at knowing our pattern. It then doesn't stop at knowing our values and our characteristics. And it then doesn't stop once we know we're developing our relationship with God and we're connected to the vine. Because James says that faith without actions is nothing. We actually have to then act on all of this that we've already done. We have to do something about it. Um, in Colossians 1, it says, As you learn more and more how God works, you will learn how to do your work. So we know that we are learning how God works by knowing our pattern, knowing our values, being connected to the vine. But like I just said, it doesn't stop there. We then have to learn how to do our work, how to do your work. It then carries on to say, this is Paul praying, we pray that you'll have the strength to stick it out over the long haul. So my threading of my um, weave was the long haul. It was quite tedious and long. And it was always really hot because it was summertime. It was really hot in the weave shed. Um, it was an old building, and it just, yeah, it wasn't the most, it wasn't the best part of, of weaving. But um, it then carries on to say, not the grim strength of gritting your teeth, but the glory strength God gives. I love that, because who wants, as a Christian, as a woman of God, that's, how I, that's what I am, a woman of God, I am someone who follows God wholeheartedly, and I try my absolute best for people to see that. But I don't want people to think I'm living my life through gritted teeth. Who wants that? Can you imagine that? To me, living life through gritted teeth is intense and it's fearful. I don't want to live my life hanging on by a thread, pun intended. <laughs> um, I just don't want that. I don't want to live with gritted teeth. Colossians 2 reminds us that we are woven into a tapestry of love by the Holy Spirit designed by Jesus. We are his workmanship. He took time on us on us. So don't live your life through gritted teeth. Don't do that. We are his workmanship. So this isn't about living through gritted teeth or striving to become or striving through life. This is about 
yielding. Yielding a life that is driven by the Holy Spirit. It also goes on to say in that scripture that it, um, when Paul is praying, it, it, he asks for strength that endures the unendurable and spills over into joy. Now, when I was threading the loom, it was something I had to endure. It wasn't really fun at all. But what is amazing is that when we get this glory strength, when we don't live our life through gritted teeth, the unendurable tasks become joyful because we are developing the fruit inside of us. We are developing the environment inside of us. And before you know it, our values are his and the things that aren't fun are fun. The things we don't enjoy doing, we enjoy. Because I hated doing my weave, but as soon as I, I knew what was going to happen, as soon as I, I saw the or had a picture of the final product, that task became fun. That task I enjoyed because I knew that I was developing something that was going to be exquisite. Um, because like I said, we are his workmanship and this is not about striving. This is not about living through gritted teeth. This is about yielding your way through a Holy Spirit. And when you yield, you slow down. I don't mean slow down like, oh, let's, go, let's not do anything all week. Let's just take a rest and we'll watch some TV and, I don't know, we don't need to go out. We'll say no to anything. I don't mean that. I mean the slowing that happens in the mind, the slowing that allows you to focus and to re be refined, and it allows you to keep the main thing the main thing. The main thing being the pattern you've pre-decided, being Jesus. That is the main thing. So when you yield, you're allowing your mind to calm. It says in Colossians 2, um, sorry, no, it says in Galatians 5, and I know I've already used this, but this is from the Passion Translation. It says, as you yield to the dynamic life and power of the Holy Spirit, you will abandon the cravings of your self-life. Because as you slow down, as you keep the main thing, the main thing, as you keep Jesus, the main thing, then you stop focusing on all your fleshly desires. You stop focusing on your choices that are of the flesh and of the world around you and you revert back to your pattern. You know your characteristics and your values and you know you're connected to the vine and you're then able to make all your decisions and all your actions out of a Holy Spirit-led life and not a life led by the flesh. It says in Colossians 2, then you will have minds confident and at rest, focused on Christ. That's that rest I'm on about, that 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 quietening of the mind where you can stop all the other noise that goes on around. How often do we have other noise? Even probably sitting here today, you've all got other noise going on at the moment. But what, what God wants, what we're supposed to do if we're going to live a Holy Spirit-led life, if we are going to become fruit bearers, we need to quieten that. And we need to have minds that are confident and focused on Christ because then our decisions can be refined and we can choose Godly, we can, we can make our decision with God at the center rather than with flesh at the center. That is when the fruits are going to be developed in you. That is when the big, juicy, good fruits that we want are going to be developed in you when your mind is at rest and focused and confident. Um, I recently was in Portugal. My kids broke up a few weeks ago, and so I went on holiday to Portugal with myself, my husband, my three children, and my mom and dad. And I don't know if any of you watched the news, but we did find ourselves amongst the wildfires that were going on in Portugal, quite literally in the middle of the area that they were going on. So I would stand outside and look, and there was a fire here, here. There was smoke going behind me. There was big black smoke going over here. And... Um, I don't know what it is about fire. When you're meant to run away from it, you can't help but watch it. It's like ferocious and it draws you in and it makes you want to just stand there like this. Um, and I was watching the fire and I just knew, I knew that God was trying to say something to me. I was planning this preach as this was going on and I thought, surely these fires aren't going to go to waste. <laughs> I thought, surely there is something. And then as I was watching, the firemen literally chase fires because as an ember flew out of one fire, it landed somewhere else and created another fire. And as I was watching them, feeling sorry for the firefighters, because in Portugal, the majority of the firefighters are voluntary which is incredible. Um, but as I was watching that, I heard God say, I can just light another one. And I thought, oh, what does he mean by that? <laughs> I can just light another one. But then it occurred to me, if our environment is correct, 
If we are nurturing the environment that we are in and not focusing on the fruit that's going to be produced, but we are nurturing the environment that we are in, we are choosing our pre-decided pattern and reverting back to that, then we are knowing our values and we're knowing we're connected to the vine so our values are becoming his values and then we act on that, we are creating an environment where fresh fire can be produced, where fresh fruit can be produced. So even if your fire gets blown out, because I'm telling you now, I'm so sorry to let you know, but I'm telling you there will be times when your fire is blown out. There just will be. In life, there are times when your fire is blown out. Maybe you didn't get the job that you wanted. Maybe today has just not gone the way you thought. Maybe something has happened and you just don't know how to, do, how to deal with it. Maybe you're, you're stuck on and you can't work out what decision you need to make. But I'm telling you now, if you are doing all these right things and you are nurturing the environment that is inside you, or you are nurturing the area, then I'm telling you now, the embers that fly out from your fire that's been blown out are gonna just light a fire somewhere else. Doesn't matter where you are. They're just going to light a fire. And I was watching these firemen. Honestly, they were chasing fires. There was um, uh, uh, helicopters flying above us with huge buckets of water constantly throughout the day, going in all different directions. And I just thought, you know what? If we can nurture an environment where a fire can roar, and then an ember flies out, if that fire is blown out, I just know another fire is going to be birthed. And I am going to create an environment where God can produce the big, juicy, fresh fruit constantly. I'm going to create an environment where fresh fire is going to be able to roar. When you, um, I've, I've used the scripture already, but in John 15, it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. When you're joined with me and I with you, the relationship intimate and organic the harvest is sure to be abundant. In other words, the harvest is sure to be plentiful. The harvest is sure to, be, to happen and to come at you in large quantities. When you are connected to God and actively working on your relationship, making it organic, you are nurturing that environment and you will constantly produce fresh fire, an environment that can constantly produce a harvest that is going to be abundant. I'm just going to close with this one last story, so if the band want to join me. Um, it's from 2 Kings 4, and it's verse 1 to 7. And I am just going to read it first um, directly. So here we go. One day, the wife of a man from the Guild of Prophets called out to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead. You well know what a good man he was devoted to God. And now the man to whom he was in debt is on his way to collect by taking my two children as slaves. Elisha said, I wonder how I can be of help. Tell me, what do you have in your house? Nothing, she said. Well, I do have a little oil. Here's what you're going to do, said Elisha. Go up and down the street and borrow jugs and bowls from all your neighbors and not just a few, all you can get. Then come home and lock the door behind you, you and your sons, pour oil into each container. When each is full, set it aside. She did what he said. She locked the door behind her and her sons. As they brought the containers to her, she filled them. When all the jugs and the bowls were full, she said to one of her sons, another jug, please. He said, that's it, there's no more jugs. Then the oil stopped. She went and told the story to the man of God. He said, go sell the oil and make good on your debts. Live both you and your sons on what's left. You see, this lady was able to receive her miracle that she needed because she prepared the way. She nurtured her relationship with God and with others because do you think Let's, let's be realistic now. Do you think if she hadn't nurtured her, her environment, nurtured the relationships and the community that she was in, all these people up and down her street would have lent her bowls and jugs to the amount that she needed? Do you really think they would have done that? No, they wouldn't have. They would not have wanted to do that. They would not have wanted to help her. But because she nurtured her environment and nurtured her relationships and created an environment where God could produce fresh fire and fresh fruit, she was able to not only receive the miracle, but receive the miracle to the exact amount that she needed because that is what God does. He gives you the exact amount that you need. This lady ended up with what she needed. She built the runway in advance. She took time nurturing her environment and because of the work she did, God was able to grow the big, juicy, fresh fruit. Not only did this woman benefit though, because think about it, her sons benefited too. Her sons benefited because they didn't get taken and they didn't have to be saved. 
people around her benefited because these debt collectors didn't come to their community. The people around her benefited because that's what happens. You live in the overflow of the work that you do. And then that is there for other people, for relationships, for the people around you. And that is how we become fruit bearers. put all that work in. When I put all the work in and I followed my plan strategically, I produced exquisite fabric. I may not have got a first, I got a 2-1, but I did produce exquisite fabric. <laughs> and it was beautiful and it was, it was my work. It was something I had worked hard on. It's something I had been consistent with. I knew my pattern, I knew the characteristics of the yarn, and I was able to create an exquisite piece of fabric. Now, as Scott, and the band leaders. I have two things that I want to pray into this morning. Oh, it's actually the afternoon now, isn't it? I have two things I want to pray into this afternoon. And now if you think these are for you, either make your way to the front as um, the band brings this song, or just put your hand up if you're not feeling comfortable. But the first is, if you feel your fire has blown out and you have no idea how to get that fire back, I want to pray for fresh fire to come over you. I want to pray for a reconnection to the vine so you can create an environment where fresh fire, fresh fruit can grow. Number two, if you feel that you haven't quite set your pattern out yet, you're not quite sure what your pattern is, you're a bit undecided on where your pattern should be, on what you need to revert back to, then I want to pray for clear vision for you so that you can now make that decision and choose what your pattern is going to be. 